Thank you for joining us. My name's Ian Stroud. And my name is David Malone. And this is Hyperland. Well, on the today's edition, we are really pleased to be able to welcome Chris Blackhurst. He's um, an award-winning business writer. He was the former editor of The Independent. Ten years he was city editor of The Evening Standard, and before that he worked at The Sunday Times on their insight and investigations, amongst other things. Um, Chris, thank you very much for joining us. Absolute pleasure. We are talking to you this morning about your new book, um, Too Big to Jail, um, which I have to say is a fantastic book because the story of HSBC and its money laundering, I genuinely thought I knew a lot about that. Um, and then I read your book and realised I didn't know anything about it. <laughs> the rabbit. Did you realise how deep that rabbit hole went when you started or was it a surprise to you? I think it was a mixture. I knew it went deep, but you're quite right. I didn't realise it went that deep. And I think the the more you get into it and the more the more brazen the drug cartel was, and I didn't realise the extent of that. The Cayman Islands um, was really quite horrific. Um, <laughs> and then And then the political interference at the end to stop them the Americans would would I didn't and I didn't appreciate before just how keen the Americans were to bring prosecutions. Right. Um, yeah. well, that's interesting because that's the one bit I was aware of, but everything up to that point, um, yeah, I just yeah I had no idea that the rabbit. Well, it's one of those. Is it's a funny. I was city editor at the time of the Evening Standard, and I was aware of the story, um, but. You know, it's one of those curious things sometimes happens in the media where a big story breaks and for all sorts of reasons and, you know, it just doesn't take off. And and I think one of the telling things about this particular story is that even when it was all done and dusted and they'd agreed, um, you know, they'd, they'd agreed a fine with the Americans of... Um, $1.8 billion, the record fine. Um, and they agreed as well that they would go into some sort of rehab reform program. <laughs> but while it was all, when it was all done and dusted, um, that was it. There's nothing happened here in the UK. And, and yet HSBC is Britain's biggest bank by far. Um, and there was no inquiry Nobody, nothing happened in the House of Commons. Uh, the all the different regulators couldn't care less. Um, nobody actually lost their job. That was that um, was Osborne and the FCA at that time. Yeah, wasn't it, Chris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what happened for the benefit of your uh, for the, your listeners is that um, the Americans wanted to prosecute. They got tons of evidence that HSBC through a mixture of um, negligence and in some offices, particularly at the Mexico end, um, some corruption, they wanted to prosecute. They wanted to prosecute the bank. And part of the, the irony of this is one of the reasons the Americans wanted to bring a prosecution was that they were very aware and very sensitive to the allegation that no bank was prosecuted over 2008. Mm, right. So they really wanted to throw the book at HSBC and they were all ready to do that. I mean, they, they, they effectively, um, I mean, they, they really were ready to do it, the department of justice. And, um, right at the last minute, there was this intervention from George Osborne, who was then the chancellor, right? Yeah. Effectively saying, if you prosecute HSBC, first of all, he tried to play the, the the foreign card, saying you're only doing this because we're a for because it's a foreign bank. Yeah. Well that was not that was nonsense. I mean absolute nonsense. That was thrown out. And then the second claim, the one that stuck was um if you prosecute HSBC bankers, you threaten to bring down the bank and you threaten to bring down the entire banking system. And that was eventually believed by by the Americans. And the irony of that is that that was the very same argument 
that was used in 2008. Yeah, I was going to say, isn't that what Hank Paulson said? If anything, a more egregious example. I mean, we're talking about money laundering here. We're talking about money laundering of billions and billions of dollars. We're not talking about, you know, some mortgage lending that had gone wrong. This was pretty awful stuff. And um, um, the same argument was used. So you have to ask, at what point, if ever, are we ever going to prosecute bankers? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I've got something more in common with um, a chap that you might know, Curtis Warren. He was yeah. um, a friend's brother, was was sort of linked with him. And then the, the, there's a book called Cocky. Um, he was yeah. in, involved with the Cali cartel yeah. and uh, had dealings with someone called Mario Halley, who was described as the European sales manager, which just goes to show that these cartels, that they're large businesses, really. Um, and uh, he was um, accused of money laundering in 1991 was jailed yeah. for six years another yeah. chap usama al kurd um he got 14 years and a million pound fine well well i mean as we speak um el chapo who ran the sinaloa cartel yeah. he's in effectively solitary confinement for the rest of his life plus 30 years i don't don't ask me how that works <laughs> and not just him i mean his associates have all been taken down a lot of them yeah uh, you know the other point you make is quite right is that and i think this was something you know you asked did i appreciate the depth of it before uh -huh. one thing i hadn't appreciated until i really started looking into chapo and the sinaloa cartel yeah was the the sheer level of organization um and and we are all taught that made to think that the drug bosses are bloodthirsty monsters who literally just go around killing people and doing horrible things well they yeah. do do that there's a bit of that but that isn't their main business their main business is um i mean if you if step back from it from a second and treat drugs as a commodity you know it, it is literally growing cultivating um you know harvesting transporting um packaging selling um finding market i mean they yeah. are he was running a massive massive um almost effectively a multinational corporation yeah, and that was um, that was my point, Chris. That that in, in, although if you take the drugs out of it and and that illegality, they are they are money laundering, and these guys are getting fourteen years for it. So why why yeah. is a society that we because of the connection with the drugs will will prosecute them? But we're it's exactly the same as what the banks are doing. Well, well, I I say in the book that the the. The war on drugs was declared by Ronald Reagan. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. In, I think I think 1982 from memory. Um, well, yeah, the war on drugs then is just about the longest war we've ever had. Yeah. Um, it's had no impact at all. Drugs are still as rampant as they ever were. Um, even the Sinaloa cartel is still the biggest cartel in the world yeah. in Mexico. Um, they're now using Chinese banks um to wow. launder money um and challenger banks and all that stuff so you know the war on drugs hasn't worked and the, the problem here and this is in the book that it's much easier for a, a cop in the states or even in britain wherever it is to take down a dealer yeah you know you see somebody on a street corner they're clearly doing something dodgy search them you find some drugs you've got an arrest yeah and you're going to get a conviction and it is much easier to do that than try and trace complicated financial transactions and the reason they're complicated is that of course we have a whole industry that exists to help people hide their money yes um yeah. and, and these are professionals i mean we we take this sort of thing for granted but you know we casually chuck out phrases like secretive offshore tax haven or something like that. we don't really know 
what that means. Yeah. Um, what it means is incredibly sophisticated professional advisors whose job it is is to hide people's money and their wealth. And that's the industry the poor old cops are up against. Mm -hmm. And in the book, I, I you know, um, the phrase, uh, it was never actually used in, um, in Watergate. Um, it, everyone thought it was. It was in the movie, but not the not the <laughs> not the book. But the phrase "follow the money," yeah, and you know we don't. And so what happens is the street dealers get caught, um, and in America, three times caught, three strikes, and you're out. You get a very heavy sentence. Um, I think it can be life in in some states, yeah. California, and um, but they're replaced. They're easily replaced because it's easy money. I but, mean, okay, but, you take the risk. But the, the guys at the top who uh, – and then we then we say to us, yeah, we, we, we don't ask ourselves, well, how come they've got Ferraris? How come <laughs> Chapo had five mansions, two zoos, um, a little train that went around the zoo? Because yeah. his thing, the thing that really turned him on was big cats. And so he had literally a collection of – panthers and pumas and jaguars and and tigers and um you know where's the, how do you buy this sort of stuff well that's the point uh, isn't it that that the 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 front end of the drug business is cash because i don't know anyone who buys their cocaine with their visa card you've got to hand over cash <laughs> <laughs> so, so the idea they're going to phase out cash i've always thought well that's going to make a lot of junkies very very unhappy the whole of the of the whole of the island, yeah. dogs will have a collective nervous breakdown thing. <laughs> but then they've got. But then you can't buy all the things you just listed with cash. You can't walk into a Ferrari dealership. Well, maybe you can. No. But you certainly no. can't rent a plane, uh, or with no. with a, a, a trunk full of slightly greasy ten dollar bills. No, that 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 really is the point. That, that, <laughs> uh, particularly, uh, you know, we. We never really stop to think what's going on here. And and basically, you're quite right. You sell drugs on the street. Um, it doesn't matter who you sell it to. You're not going to get something that's traceable. So you'll get cash back. The cash is a, inevitably a, a filthy, crumpled mm. dollar bill. Now, if you're dealing at Chapo's level, we are talking about billions of these things. But that's right. Let's, give, a, let's give an a, 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 just a a hint of the scale because from your book there was you it, it came out to be 16.1 billion in cash between two yeah. just between 2004 and 2008 i mean that's yeah that's lorry loads you'd have to have a train well, it's, to it's, shift it's all lorry that. loads that's that's <laughs> the point and and you know they were the number one narcotics supplier for the United States and Canada, um, they were selling, um, well, anything anybody wanted, but uh, from marijuana to coke to heroin to... Well, they got um, into crystal meth as well, didn't they? That's the other part. Meth. They had laboratories. Um, and he treated it, and this is in the book. I mean, one of the, one of the, the, the ironies here, I think I make the point, is that HSBC took a decision to, they weren't content with being the best bank in the world, and they were voted the best-run bank in the world. They actually took a conscious decision. They wanted to be the biggest bank in the world. Yeah. Well, if you want to be the biggest bank in the world, you've got to be everywhere. And the biggest banks in the world are Bank of America and Citigroup. Mm -hmm. And you have to have branches and a network that covers the whole globe. You can't just be big in Asia, which is what HSBC was. Um, and the UK, that's not good enough, not big enough. So they set out to be the biggest bank in the world. They buy this bank in Mexico, which no one's ever heard of. Meanwhile, Chapo, um, for all his lack of, I mean, the, 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 the juxtaposition, of course, is that HSBC is run by a guy who was at Oxford, McKinsey, you know, all those things. We're talking about Lord Green. Yeah, Chapo, Chapo is barely educated i mean he didn't really go to school um can barely read and write but he has similar ambition to build the biggest drugs organization in the world and 
And then they helped each other. <laughs> they two come together and they help each other. Now, the end result of that is, as you rightly point out, that Chapo is left with billions of dollars in cash. And you cannot walk into a bank. And, I mean, you know, it's, it's shown sometimes in mob films, people walking into banks with holdalls full of cash. Yeah. Well, you try it. You can't do it. You can't do it in America. You know, alarm bells go off. It will not happen. So his solution was to smuggle the money, the cash, back down the same routes as he was using to bring the drugs into the States. So, And, and we're talking about um, he had 13 aircraft, he had submarines, he had lorries, he had tunnels. I mean, every type of transport you can think of was being used. So they were shipping the drugs over and shipping the cash back. Then he has another problem, which is if you open a Mexican bank account, it has to be in pesos. So this this was peso, a Bittle bank, wasn't it? Bittle? The HSBC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think people people pronounce it Betal. I think Betal. anyway, so Betal was the bank, and that was the bank that they brought, they bought. And they were warned. HSBC were explicitly warned by the Mexicans, by other people, but even by their own people. Mm -hmm. that this bank, which was the fifth biggest in Mexico, and no one had really ever heard of it, it was heavily concentrated in the drug region, which is in the north of the country, towards the American border. Yeah. Um, they were explicitly told, this bank doesn't do compliance. <laughs> and HSBC took this, dare I say it, rather arrogant British, almost imperialist attitude, because yeah. that was their background, of saying, well, you know, we'll bring our own standards and procedures to bear. Yeah. Um, we'll sort it out. Well, of course they didn't. They in their quest to be the biggest bank in the world, they promptly forgot about Mexico, left it to the Mexicans, um, and um carried on buying other other businesses across the world in order to be number one. Yeah. Chapo's problem was that the the peso is not it's all right in Mexico, but it's not an international currency. And I was there when it was devalued. I was there on the on the day. You can't rent a plane in Miami, charter a plane in Miami with pesos. You need a whole hell happen. of a lot of pesos. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's not it's not going to happen. I mean, yeah. they wouldn't accept it. Yeah. So he wanted dollars, and HSBC, which had bought Bital. And what let, let's be clear, I mean, Chapo himself was not walking into a bank and sitting down with a bank manager. And yeah, you know, but what was happening was that across that region of Mexico, thousands of, and I mean thousands, of small businesses were opening accounts and they were giving all sorts of spurious details about themselves. I mean, I think as in the book, there's a woman who she claimed that her income was. Twenty thousand dollars, whatever it was, she grew melons and avocados in a backyard, and in in a month she deposited three hundred fifty thousand in cash. Wow! And wow. That's so quite, that's quite a few avocados. So bells should have gone off, and they didn't. Yeah. And, and they, these clients were, you know, I'd really like to get into dollars. And HSBC said, "Oh, well, we've got a way around that. You can, we can set up a." an account for you in the Cayman Islands, uh, HSBC Mexico. Um, all you do is pay it into this, pay it into Mexico, into your bank account here. We will transfer it to the Cayman Islands account. It's the Cayman Islands branch. Well, Which is I in say, dollars but, now. That's the key yeah, thing. Which immediately goes into dollars, which then enables Chapo to buy his planes, his cars, educate his children at private schools, buy yeah. houses, uh, not just Chapo, but all his associates. Yeah. And um, the point I make in the book, which is, I think, the most shocking thing of all, really, or one of the many things, was that there never was a branch in Mexico, in the Cayman Islands. It, you know, we all think of a branch, of bank branch, as, you know, having a cash machine, steps, a door, a lobby, tills, yeah. you know, a tiled floor, that's the sort of feel we have for a bank. 
it's a solid building. There was no building called HSBC Mexico Cayman Islands. There never was. No, it, it was all entirely on desktop in Mexico City in the HSBC offices. Yeah, so it's it's a fiction, an electronic fiction that it's, yeah. it's just what you call those particular accounts, which mean that they're situated outside of exactly, Mexican yeah, or US law. Yeah. 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 And and one of the things that I'd like to bring up is that it just as the banks, individual banks, when they do get done for money laundering, always say, well, it was just a few bad apples in the bank and, you know, we'll get rid of them. Your story isn't that there's a globe of fine upstanding banks and HSBC just happened to go a bit off the rails. Um, that that I, I can't think of a major bank that hasn't at some point been done for money laundering. And on the Cayman thing, that, that kind of banking license, again, you, you make this clear in the book, that that kind of banking license where you're allowed to say this is a Cayman bank, but it's, there is no bank, the Class B license, yeah, there was a hundred and I think you said there's 149 um, Cayman bank licenses, and 136 of them are the Class B. So there's 136 yeah. banks around the world that are running this. We have a Cayman Island branch, so you can get into yeah. dollars. I, I, and I would say as well that there's, there's several things there. One is that it was exactly right. Um, second is the Cayman Islands, uh, as I point out in the book, is uh, it's not it's not a rogue state. The Cayman Islands is protected by Britain. Right. You know, we look after the Cayman Islands. Um, there's well, a look, government. Well, of course there. we do. We have important banks there, Chris. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, but you know, the, the crazy thing is that our government ministers stand up in the House of Commons or at party conferences, and they've been doing this for the last oh God, I mean, the last thirty thirty years. I can remember saying, now we're going to crack down on tax avoidance, blah, blah, blah. We're going to move against tax havens. Well, some of the leading tax havens of the world, offshore havens, are are run by Britain. And whether it's Channel Islands, Gibraltar, British Virgin Islands, Cayman Islands, they are all run effectively by Britain. We could close them down tomorrow if we wanted to, yeah. but we don't. Oh, but that's because we we then have a we'd be handing an unfair advantage to Luxembourg, Ireland. Well, that's, that brings me on to the next thing. The second <laughs> thing is, you rightly point out that what I say in the book about the Class B license, yeah, that is only the Caymans. All <laughs> those places have similar similar structures, so it, it, there is an entire industry devoted to helping people hide their money, launder their money. I mean, no wonder we don't get anywhere. Yeah. Um, because, you know, as I say, there's an entire sector of people, professional services, who exist only to do this. But that's the point, isn't it? That, that we confuse drug lords with money launderers, but the Drug lords don't launder money. They they are good at selling drugs and organising import export businesses. But the money launderers are people at the Rotary Club, people who yeah. dine at the House of Lords. They're the actual yeah. people who do the money laundering. I mean, El Chapo couldn't launder money if his life depended on it because he doesn't. <laughs> we we don't make the mental connection, so we are we are taught to think of um, drug lords as you know, people who carry machine guns and murder people and do horrible things. And then we're, we're also taught that banks are upright and proper um, and the two don't connect. Well, they do connect. Uh, one is helping the other. Mm. And um, and then my, my other point, I mean, you mentioned dining at the House of Lords and things, is that in my experience, the, having met many, many top business people, the thing that really bothers them more than anything, they make their money, they've made money, they've got their house in this townhouse in London, they've got their house in the country, they've got their villa in the south of France, they've got their, they've done all that, they've got all that. 
the thing that really bugs them and bothers them as they get older is their reputation. Yeah. And that comes down to personal, um, you know, uh, finding a banker. It, finding a bank is about the same as finding a footballer a week's wages. Yes, yeah. that, that, that's a very it's, important point, is that... It has no impact at all. I mean, even the 1.8 billion, you know, largest fine in American history is written off as the cost of doing business. That's part of the, um, the financial setup of the banks, really, isn't it? And, and a exactly, percentage you know, of what they're making, they're sort of saying... Exactly, and as I say in the book, it amounted to... If we all gasped at the size of the fine. Mm. It's five weeks' profits. Yeah, yeah. I worked, it, I worked this out for another, I think it was the Wachovia case, that the fine they were given, I think I worked it out as it, it worked out as something like one two thousandth of the money they'd made from laundering yeah. the money. So that's not a fine. That's, that's, surely that's more like the fiver that you press into the hand of the doorman on the nightclub oh, you want is. to it's go a, to. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, exactly. you, that's so, not a fine. That's just tipping the, the doorman. So the only thing that will... We'll, bring bankers to their senses, stop them behaving in such a reckless reckless manner, um, is the threat of jail. And the reason for that is that the threat of jail impacts on their personal freedom and um, they can no longer have the best seats at the opera. They might not be invited to play golf. Yeah. Their wives will, will be whispered about at the school gate. All those things that a part of their world, mm -hmm. you know, uh, 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 and their nice, comfy living, they will be taken from them should they go to jail. Yeah. Um, and their reputation will be trashed. Um, but so far, that simply hasn't happened. No senior banker anywhere has been jailed from 2008. Take your pick. Yeah. yeah. There's a on. And it's the same excuse used, um, you know, the, the one where if you bring the bank down, if you go for a criminal prosecution and yeah. it loses its banking licence, then the sky falls on everyone's head. That's what they always say. So, so how can it be that, I think I'm right in saying that when the Americans wanted to move against HSBC, HSBC was employing 330,000 people. Yeah. Now, let's say they wanted to prosecute five or ten. Well, that still leaves 330,000 people. Um, <laughs> and Good point, Chris. You know, the bank, the bank is going to carry on regardless. Well, yes, and in exactly. fact, it's an indictment of a bank the size of HSBC that should some senior employees, for some reason, not be available, the whole bank apparently will collapse. Now, you can argue that Yes, but they, they the bank's reputation has been solid and people don't want to be associated with it. I don't think people are that stupid. No, that's not uh, gonna happen. That's think, absolute common. I mean I mean one of the one of the jokes, by the way, and I've had this raised with me, so I may as well confess it now. <laughs> um people have said to me, Assume you no longer bank at HSBC. And I've said, Well, actually I do, and they're horrified. <laughs> um, well, and the reason the reason for that, very simply, is um, trying to move a bank account is a nightmare. I don't want. I can't be bothered. Yeah. Well, I'm now, with you. I'm with you. I, I I bought my house during the pandemic, and all the banks were not lending at the time. So I tried to go to any number of more upstanding banks, and they all said, "Sorry, we're not lending." So I ended up at HSBC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just like you. Ah, oh, dear, oh dear. Yeah. So, I mean, for all I know, I've got sort of red flags on my account and, you know, be very careful. I doubt it. Um, I don't think they care. Well, well honestly, if they didn't notice El Chapo, I mean, you're quite <laughs> famous, Chris, but not that, not that famous. <laughs> uh, um, we, as a point out towards the end of the book, we, we just simply have not got it right. There is a, no. a sector of... Um, but is it, is, it, is it that we don't want to get it right, Chris? Because it's, it's, it's not just this bank. I mean, Deutsche Bank has is, is, is been involved in any number of things, you know. Well, well, I think there's, two, there's several things there. One is we are, we are brought up to believe that banks are a, a, a pillar of our society. 
Uh, and if you start eroding that, then what have you got left? So that's one argument. Second argument is that inevitably these will be very complicated cases. And the truth is juries um, do not understand this stuff. Why should they? Um, and, you know, if you put numbers in front of people, they their eyes start swimming yeah um and you know are you really going to set aside six months for a trial um if you're the state prosecutor you can absolutely guarantee that against you will be the best cleverest uh, most slippery um lawyers that hsbc or anybody can buy yeah. and yeah. they will tie you in knots and you know in the end is it worth it i would argue yes it is because you know for all that on one side and i do say this in the book it does come down to a very simple thing which is the, the difference between right and wrong yeah and once you start making excuses as to why you can't prosecute people why you can't move against the bank then you're you're blurring the line yeah um and the the point I, I i make in the book is that i mean even at the end hsbc were able to negotiate a settlement with the americans well i can't negotiate a settlement if i go leave my house you know and go and hit somebody in the face um i will be charged with assault there's no no question of me having the ability to negotiate yeah um why should these people have the ability to negotiate and by the way once you start negotiating once you cross into the area of negotiation then that's for, that's food and drink for a bank that's what they do yeah that's yeah. what they're experts at they, they can negotiate their way out of anything yeah well i mean let's also just look at how high up this went because the people prosecuting the or try looking assembling the prosecution weren't just a you know a, a couple of gumshoes in america you had the office of the control of the currency you had the permanent subcommittee on investigations and as you say in the book that's like being investigated by the archangel gabriel <laughs> you know it doesn't yeah. get the, 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 i can't think of a more frightening bunch of people with it, with any more power than them and if they, with the Department of Justice in America, can then be deflected, then then what hope is there? And the fact that George Osborne then personally intervened, saying, "Oh gosh, we don't want you to, you know, to prosecute our bank," and then you end up with just what is it? They called it, what is it called it the deferred prosecution. Is that what they call it now? Yeah, deferred prosecution agreement, which basically always just means, gosh. Yes, we admit that money might have been laundered through the bank, but the bank didn't do it. We weren't aware. Sorry, we'll we'll improve. Um, well, it's a bit more than that. The, the, this is one of the things that no one really paid attention to, and I, I'm probably one of the few people who's bothered to read this thing. But the the actual settlement, the admissions from HSBC, they run to 31 pages. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's a lot of things to admit to. <laughs> they're admitting to an awful lot. And it's not the, I mean, the picture you have, the picture you're invited to to have is, and I do make this comparison in the book, um, it, it, it's very similar to Apocalypse Now, where, you know, you've got, uh, you've got a colonel, Marlon Brando's in the jungle in Vietnam and he's out of control. Um, well, that's really what happened, that Mexico was out of control. But one of the things that I didn't know until I did the so I started the research was that the Americans actually came to London and interviewed HSBC bosses at Canary Wharf. And this was for depositions for the grand jury. It went to grand jury. Hmm. It was that close to... To being prosecuted and um he, i'd not appreciated that before yes and that so it then means you've got to get the chancellor to write a letter saying please don't do this 
So it did get incredibly... I mean, the Americans were set to do it, weren't they? Yes, they were. And the reason was that they got the... Um, they got plenty of evidence. Um, they'd had three separate strands of inquiry. They were really fed up. Their country was being flooded with drugs, still is, but was being flooded with drugs, principally from the Sinaloa cartel. And this was a way of breaking or try, attempting to break them. And they were... They were, yeah, the, the Americans were genuinely angry, as were the Mexicans. I mean, mm -hmm. we all forget that the the Mexican authorities, uh, and they're very brave, by the way. I mean, they live in a country where, you know, they are trying to do their best. I mean, we think, uh, again, we, you know, we are sort of taught or made to think that they're possibly corrupt. They're not, really. Uh, they are very brave and they take huge risks. And they were fed up. They've been warning HSBC. The warnings have been ignored. And they started su supplying evidence to the, to the Americans. Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing. The, the, the Mexicans had been warning for a decade. It's not like yeah. just last Wednesday. No, they've been warning consistently and... And then within HSBC, because HSBC was such a, a hierarchical structure, warnings only went so far. They never, I mean, they, there are emails in the book or, you know, evidence where they did go to the top, but only towards the end. Yeah, but at some point, people did know. I mean, the top people, the top HSBC people in Mexico, they knew. Yeah, uh, and and it uh, had made its way through to HSBC. Yeah. I mean, Canary Wharf. I mean, how the Mexicans resented came to resent the HSBC way, and how uh, one of the bank supervisors is invited to dinner at someone's apartment, an HSBC executive's apartment, and he's telling him how wonderful it is, and the bank supervisor's thinking, you know. I was only here a few months ago and it was someone else was living here. This is a service department. Um, they don't learn the language, which they found insulting. Mm. Um, they weren't there for very long. And then, you know, towards the, towards the end, um, the number two in the bank, Michael Gagan, flies into Mexico on a, a sort of grand glad-handing tour. And at that point, he is met by two bank, two senior, very senior um, bank supervisors and taken into a room and told what's been going on at his bank in Mexico. And that that is really the first time it hits home. Mm. And the, the, the one thing that after that that really did hit home to HSBC was the threat from the Americans to withdraw their banking charter. Which would have meant they couldn't have banked in Mexico in the United States, yeah. And that suddenly, that when good. they realised that was being discussed, they suddenly jumped into action. Mm. But I mean, again, it's something that you deal with in the book, and I think it was it's important to bring out is that when we say the bank might not have been aware, um, there are whole um, legislations to, that are in place to make sure that banks should be aware. You know, you have yeah. risk officers and you have compliance officers. And it was an amazing statistic in the book where you said, look, 2007, HS HSBC had 16,500 employees, of which 198 were in compliance. And, yeah. and some of those had been outsourced to India. So those are the people who are supposed to be checking the, the accounts to make sure that yeah. no money laundering has gone on. 198 out of 16,500. Uh, yeah. I mean, come on. It's the classic thing. Um, you know, we wait for the day when the head of compliance becomes the head of the bank. <laughs> Good luck with uh, that. <laughs> it's never going to happen. I mean, <laughs> no. compliance, compliance is regarded pretty much on the same level as the referee on the football pitch. You know, I, th I think you're being the generous there, actually. <laughs> <laughs> They're there to get in the way and stop the action. Um, and they don't earn the big money. They're not the people doing the deals. Um they they are um they're a nuisance. Um 
But the banks will say, no, they're not. We take them very seriously. But you only have to look at the numbers. And they even, um, I think there's, there's one person in the book where she is um, on a fast track. And she's got this whole sort of, this whole brief of different jobs, one of which is compliance. Uh, and... It, it, it's an afterthought. I mean, ideally, they wouldn't want they don't want they don't want compliance at all. Um, they'd rather there wasn't any. Yeah, uh, and it, it's it's wrong. They they should be made. And then the other thing, which, which I do, I think I highlight in the book is that when you talk to the bank, um. And any bank, by the way, it doesn't matter if it's HSBC or any bank, they will tell you how they always tell journalists and people like me how brilliant they are. I mean, they they will not hold back in telling you how fantastically successful they are, how much the better they are than any other bank. Like you, I've met them. Yeah, I've had dinner with them. How much even how much better they are than their clients. (laughs) um they have very grand buildings that's in the book um you know they specialize in having fantastic atriums fantastic i mean some of the best meals that i've ever had have been in uh, with executives in the hospitality suites of banks yeah me too in Uh, ireland yes i mean quite extraordinary and and you think well first of all you think who's paying for all this but I've never really been able to get my head round why and why they think that they need to behave like this, but they do behave like that, yeah. and um, you, you know they they lay it on and lay it on thick. So they're busy telling you how fantastically brilliant they are. Um, uh, I remember it was not HSBC, but I remember going to Lehman just before it went under. And we sat at the top of their building in Canary Wharf. I had a lunch with the top people in London. It was honestly a silver service. The meal was as good as anything you'd get, say, in Gavroche or a restaurant like that. The wine was out of this world. And in the lift on the way down, I remember they had these signs saying, welcome our new intake. And then there was this list of who they were. And there was something like five Olympic gold medalists, wow. six, six. I mean, there's this list of honours they'd all won. Mm. And like they, they they really believe they're super, you know, masters of the universe. Yeah. That's, that's what they believe. Yeah. And it was only probably three or four weeks after that, the bank went down. Yeah. Well, I mean, the other thing is, you know, banks are supposed to report suspicious activity reports, SARs, and and I think HSBC from what you from the book, I think they'd let something like seventeen thousand of these things just accumulate in a big dusty drawer, and not done anything with them. Yeah. So what's the point? You've got no compliance officers. You're not bothering to actually action any of the suspicious activity reports. And in two thousand and four. You decide, I know what we'll do. We'll move our U.S. headquarters to the state of Delaware, which is more secretive yeah. than Switzerland. Well, that doesn't yeah. that sort of suggest that there is – It's because it's easy to say it's all oversight and, oh, they were too busy, but not, not actioning parts of the law, like the, the suspicious activity reports, and deciding to move your headquarters to a much more secretive location. Those are things done on purpose. Yeah, no, absolutely, uh, no question. And in fact, when it came to when they realised that they got the all these um, SARs, they're called mm. all these transactions that nobody had looked at. Their solution was actually even then the classic, the classic one of arrogance, which was to literally go into the market and hire. I can't remember the number now, but it's in the book. So many hundred um, people to go through them and look at them. And all they did was throw quantity at the problem. They thought, we'll hire loads of people. They'll go through it. Um, They were paid. um, The people, they were paid by how many transactions they'd looked at in an hour. 
<laughs> not how many they found that were suspicious. And, and one of the things that happened is that there's this um, whistleblower comes forward, uh, somebody who uh, tried to join the, the CIA, couldn't get in, applied Are you to talking join about the, Everett Stern? Everett Stern, yeah. yeah. And Everett Stern, who who who's is on the side of right, um, he wanted to serve his country. He couldn't but anyway. He he joined the bank and in the anti money laundering department, ho ho, in Delaware, and was really shocked by what he saw because every time he raised a suspicious transaction with his supervisor, the effectively the supervisor was wishing he hadn't. Yeah, <laughs> it was an inconvenience. So rather you didn't because we're getting paid by. The quant every time you yeah. call a halt because you found something means we're not getting through it quick enough. Yeah. So he then goes back to the CIA and says, I've got something to tell you. And that was one of the things where the Americans knew they were on very strong ground because they they had investigators, but they also had a whistleblower. Well, I mean the whistleblower is a separate issue. I mean Probably later, in a day or two, we're going to talk to Jonathan Sugarman, who is a, a, a banking whistleblower. And the thing is, they're treated, as, as ever it was in your book, as criminals because they've divulged... They've the done in their job, though. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, they, their job is to not divulge the secrets yes. of the bank. And yeah. when they do... I mean, why do we even have a word whistleblower? That's like if I saw someone being mugged yeah. and told the police, does that make me a, a whistleblower? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it is a. I started working in the city in, I mean, a long time ago. Um, so, <laughs> a very long time ago. Um, but you were taught on no account, you know, uh, you, you know, the, all your values are thrown up in the air. It's it's your your firm first, um, family and friends second. You know, yeah. for you 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 snitch. And it's almost a, a, you know, a male, a male. Is it male? Do women have the same issues? I think they probably do. Mm. But certainly, a, a boys, you're taught very early on. You know, we don't like snitches. We don't like the one who's the grass. We don't like the one who's blowing the whistle. Yeah. And you know, if you blow the whistle, okay, you get your moments in the sun, but you will be ostracized. I you will not yeah. get a job. You will not get a job in the city of London or Wall Street ever again. Yeah, I don't know a single whistleblower story that ends happily, and I've talked to a lot. No, 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 no. I, 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 I can't think of any. And I've met a few. I've met the people who uh, did Enron and mm. all, all sorts of things down the years, um, and they've taken a conscious decision because they're quite right. You know, found something wrong, but society. It doesn't really uh, – they're, they're not rewarded for that. Yeah. I mean, In fact, they're punished. Just a, a last a last thought, which is, uh, is, again, going back to this notion that this isn't something peculiar to HSBC um, and a link to the, the financial crash because, of course, one of the things that all the banks wanted after 2008 was, was cash, was, was fungible assets, as they say. And I couldn't help but think – that obviously then anyone who's laundering drug money is going to weather the financial crash better than other people because you've got billions of cash coming in. Um, and I then looked at, the, remember, you know, the um, the two Spanish enclaves in North Africa, Ceuta and Melilla or something, I always get the names wrong. And they're little tiny dusty enclaves and everyone who lives there is dirt poor. But when I looked, it, both of them are absolutely stuffed with big banks, most of the Spanish banks, offering high net worth individual private services. And I thought, well, that's not being offered to the local goat herders, but it is the yeah. major drug route coming out of South America. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, the banks um, the banks want cash. Um, they, uh, it was easy money. I, I, uh, I mean, it was a, section in the book where when they first went into mexico um people in the bank were a bit skeptical um not just about the bank they were buying but 
about Mexico itself, um, they ignored all the warnings, not just warnings about the bank, but also warnings about the country. You know, they, they the fact that drug cartels are, are endemic, um, it's a terrible problem for the Mexicans and Mexicans' authority. But lo and behold, within a couple of years of going into Mexico, they're announcing to a rapturous audience at the AGM uh, the annual general meeting that the profits from Mexico revenues from Mexico have gone through the billion dollar barrier. <laughs> um, and then you think, well, of course, no one in the hall stopped to say, excuse me, how did that happen? Well, Chris, it was obviously it was those avocados and melons. Come on. <laughs> exactly. But how does it happen that a country that is not really, let's face it, one of the, I mean, it's, this economy is a lot healthier now than it was. But at that time, it wasn't. How's it suddenly producing those sorts of revenues for us? Um, and they, instead of thinking we need to find out, they just carried on. And Surely they thought yeah. to themselves, we must not find out. <laughs> yeah, you're, um, I'm probably being a slightly it's odd for me to say, I'm probably being a bit more generous. I think you're probably nearer the truth. <laughs> <laughs> but... Because, I mean, you, know, you, you you couldn't ignore the figures. I mean, one of the things that the Americans threw at them was that they were they were dealing in so they were dealing in cash dollars. And we're talking we really are talking dollar bills here. Yeah. They were dealing in more cash dollars than the whole of um, all the other banks in Latin America combined. Wow. More, much more. I mean, huge, huge amounts. So they they were taking them by truck, so the the dollars come in are paid into Mexico. And as I say in the book, Chapo had special uh, pouches made that fitted under the teller's window, so the whole transaction could be over in a matter of seconds. They're depositing so much cash. You said in the book it's about nine hundred thousand dollars in a yeah, day. Yeah, the, the dollars were taken back to the states, but they were having to hire armored cars, outriders, and going into the, um, taking the money back to HSBC in the, in the United States. Yeah, there's no way on earth that HSBC didn't know that they were warned. The is the sheer volume. Of business that was going, uh, and as you say, from from mel melon. I mean, the 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 melon and avocado grower. <laughs> the one the one who said she only earned twenty thousand dollars a year, if it was, and her money, her account, was one of the accounts used to um to to buy an aircraft. <laughs> uh, and Chapo had thirteen of them. We're on the wrong business. We are. Well, I'm afraid you do think that. I mean, well, they have fairly, they have fairly barbaric marketing techniques, though. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's all very well. It's all very well me saying in the in the city, city of London and Wall Street, you're taught very early on not to blow the whistle. The Mexicans have a way of teaching you as well, yeah. <laughs> and it's um, it's not very pleasant. It usually involves quite radical surgery without anesthetic. Yeah. 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 Listen, Chris, it's been fantastic talking to you. Um, are you doing okay. any more research along these lines? That, that no, be... my next book, which I'm um, finishing now, is um, The World's Biggest Cash Machine. Oh, that's, um, that's about the glazers. It's about the glazers yeah. and how the glazers um, destroyed the soul of the beautiful, about, about, the, about the glazers and Manchester United. Yeah. Yeah, well, Ian will want you so, back on the show for him for that one. I can, I I can see the on. tear in his eye from here. I'll happily come on and talk about it. That would be brilliant. Chris. Listen, thank Chris, you thank you much. so much. Okay. It's been great thank talk you. to you. Thanks. Bye. Wow, that was amazing. Well, our thanks to Chris Blackhurst and um, talking to us about his book, Too Big to Jail. So anyone who thought that um, money laundering was a small problem, buy yourself a copy of the book and prepare to be horrified. Yes. <laughs> That was uh, he was he was really interesting. He was and forthright and knew what he was talking about. I mean, yeah. Like I said, I thought I knew a lot about that story, and then I <laughs> realised I didn't know anything. There was a little bit more. And if you did like that, um, look out for the interview we did with Jonathan Sugarman uh, about whistleblowing in general. So a very good story. And we've got other stories 
like AI, COVID, bird flu, and energy. So if you like that, follow us, like it. Leave us a review. And if you'd like to leave a comment, we've set up on Substack a Hyperland. Substack, go to Substack, look up Hyperland, leave us a comment. We'd love to know what you thought. And if you've got any ideas you'd like us to cover, that'd be great too. Thanks very much.